excited to be here. We are a very different business than the other businesses that are being presented here. Uh, first of all, the first difference is that we are a little ripple in terms of revenues, but in terms of our effect on the world, we're like a tidal wave. And the second difference is that we are in the education sector. And the education sector up to now really hasn't been taken as seriously as it should be. But because the business sector is including um, education now, it is becoming much bigger of a, a thing to look at. Now, we are excited to be here because we'd like to tell you about Spirit of Math and because we love giving people challenges. So we're looking forward to seeing how you work with our challenge that we're going to present to you today. All right. Uh, my name is Nathan Lagan, and uh, in case you're all wondering, yes, this is my mother. I am the third generation of Spirit of Math schools. Now, I have up here our mission statement, to promote cooperation, inspire confidence, and release a genius in every child. Uh, this is very important because everything that we have done to date and that we plan on doing moving forward is going to be around this mission statement and including that, including our presentation. So as an educator, I want you to remember this. The best way to remember this is to write it down. I know you all have pieces of paper and pen, so quickly jot it, and also everyone overseas. Uh, I would like to give a really quick thank you to all of the staff. Uh, they've been really helpful no matter what time of night. Uh, we even recently scrapped our presentation, rewrote it last night, so, and they were very accommodating. <laughs> uh, and then again, our um, operations manager for Pakistan is here, and I've never seen him have such a big smile when he found out there's teams presenting from Pakistan. So that's very big. Now, what we're gonna be doing is, before we talk about our niche company, we're gonna be talking about the market, moving into our history along with our company, and then talking about the challenge. And so I'll pass over to Kim. We would like to th um, welcome everyone here. First of all, the education market. In uh, Canada and the US, it is a significant driver. In fact, throughout the world, it is a significant driver. In Canada and the US, usually uh, schools are funded by taxation dollars. The Canadian government funding is $61 billion a year. This is for our public school systems. Governments dictate the curriculum that children must take and youth must take. Government funded colleges and universities train the teachers. Now why is this important? It's really important because they are big conglomerates and also agility is very little. In India, there's very low government funding levels and in China, what we have experienced is that, and what at least our experience has been having been there, is that the uh, Chinese government does support the Chinese schools, particularly the elite schools in the large um, cities. And those elite schools attract a lot of very elite students. Uh, there was a speech given by the CEO of Brilliant.org uh, at a TED Talks, and what she did was she wanted to talk about how important education is on an economy. And so she took two different countries, Jamaica and Singapore, and in the 1970s they were focused on tourism. Their rough, roughly their GDP per capita were about the same. And then when Singapore started investing a lot of money into education, this is when Singapore had just started to blow them out of the water. And as most of you know, Singapore is now one of the technological superpowers of the world. And Jamaica has still been relying on tourism and they've been relatively stagnant since then. So in the global marketplace, there's been a shift in education. The global pri private tutoring is projected to be 100 billion by 2018. That's huge. Currently, the U.S. spends over $5 billion a year on this, and Asia is spending higher, with South Korea spending close to $14 billion a year. Now, this is private tutoring. That's pretty enormous. The shift is enormous. So let's look at that. The shift in education has come, gone from local competition from cities 
and from countries. So if you want to compete now, it is at a global level. If you are a parent wanting to get your kids ahead, you're not just looking at what's happening in your country anymore. You're looking at how do I position my child to be at a level so that they can compete globally. Now, what has also happened is because of the computer technology now that we have, we have improved communications. We have improved accessibility. So parents are deciding that instead of just sticking with what's being offered through the governments and, and through these other schools, that they're going to decide, you know what, this isn't happening here. We're going to decide to give our children some other schooling. And so what's happened is that there's an increased autonomy for decisions and education for their kids. And I've put down here also double schooling. In other words, kids will go to school during the day and they will go afterwards as well. And that's what's happening all over the world. It used to be in Asia, a real movement there. It still is. And now it's coming to North America. So it is an expected norm for students to attend extra programs. You should be aware of this because it's going, it is already a huge trend and it is a shift in education. That brings us to the supplemental education market, which we are in. First of all, there's two different types. I've de described them. The first type is individual progression. Now, this is often as a brick and mortar. Kids will come to a school, a location. They will learn on one and one, sometimes one on three. But it really is often just going at the pace of what the child wants. It's independent. So it's usually help on the work that the kids get during their day school. And, um, and it's really usually focused on repetition and it's not dependent on teacher expertise. This is what's called as tutoring, right? So the class situation is the second one. And in the class situation, usually what happens in many of these supplementary education programs is that the class situation, the teacher is given a textbook or a curriculum and they are told, you create your own program for kids. So really, it is based on the government curriculum is usually what they do, and it's also dependent on the teacher expertise. So it is very similar to teaching of day schools. Now, where we come in is with spirit of math. Well, what's so different about us? First of all, our academic program does work with all students, but our after school program that we offer is a particular niche for high-performing students. We really believe that if you look at the kids up here, that what you're going to do when we pull them up, we take kids who have a B plus or higher overall average, and we will bring them from the top of their class to the top of the nation. We've been doing this for over 25 years. Our statistics are showing it. We have kids constantly, thousands of kids, on national contests, honor rolls every single year. Now, why is that important? It's important because when you raise up the standards from up here, you're going to, everyone else is going to start believing that more can happen, and we're going to raise the standards, not just in Canada, but globally. Now, we're not a tutoring company. We're not individual learning. The kids have to learn how to keep up with the class. They have to learn how to keep up with the tough problems we give them. So that's like real life. And it was a proprietary program, so we're not dependent on any governments <coughs> and what their curriculum are. We've created this program over 30 years. My parents, myself, and now we're getting to the third generation. This program was created with kids to see what they can do. And when we see that they can do it, then we up, up the ante. And you'll see that the program is different than anything else out there. We'll show you that very soon. So what does this require? It requires a collaborative environment, early grades up to the older grades. And our teacher qualifications, everyone has to have a degree if you're teaching grade five and up. It needs to be a degree in mathematics 
that uh, or a degree that uses mathematics. Pre-training is intensive and also ongoing training throughout that. Because of the pre-training, we have included, uh, we actually know how to train teachers in mathematics to very high level, and this is something that India has been very interested in and China has been very interested in, and so has Pakistan. Another part which is critically important is all research shows that when parents are involved in the child's education, in other words, they don't just drop the kid off and, and then come and pick them up afterwards, that those children will succeed beyond the other kids. So what happens is we have teachers sitting in the backs of our classes when the kids are in the front. They're very, um, very active in terms of talking with one another. And these are parents who aren't just... Well, they're very educated parents. We have parents who've gone to Harvard, MIT. They are leaders in our society right now. And they'll sit at the back of the class and say, I've learned a whole bunch, never mind my child. So it's huge. OK, so this is actually a grade three class. Um, part of the there's two reasons why we invite parents to sit in the back of the class. For the younger grades, I mean, when they're helping with the homework, they want to know how it was taught in school. Um, we find that there's lots of different language out there, like minus, take away, subtract. And then when the child takes a homework home, sometimes they don't know the difference between minus, subtract, and take away. And so when the parents are able to sit in the back of the class, they can transform that back at home. Um, and then also for the upper grades, uh, like grade 11, it's, it's similar to most university second year, uh, second year calculus. It gives the chance the parents to, to brush up on their math skills. <laughs> Now, because of this, we have turned into a tri-sector company. Uh, this includes our after-school schools, which we have been talking about, along with our training program. So it, it initially started um, with teaching our own teachers how to teach, and then it evolved into teaching um, uh, school divisions math and how to teach math. Uh, and through there, our publishing arm has also started to branch out into schools across Canada. Uh, but for the purpose of this competition, we would like you to focus solely on the after-school schools as that is our proof of concept, and we believe that this is the way that we'll be able to get our message across the world. So instead of just telling you about Spear Math and how we're different, we thought that we'd give you a little taste. We'll show you a little bit. And so what Kim's going to do is she's going to give you a grade one question. Okay. <laughs> All right. I've got two things in my hand, a square and a circle. Okay. So here's the question. One of them is not a square. What is the other one? The answer is a square. Many people will say it's a circle. Let's do that one more time. One of these things is not a square. What is the other? Well, if it's not a square, the other is a square. OK? Now, that's grade one, lesson two. So let's keep going. All right. Now, for grade five, uh, before we show you this problem, we want to remind uh, don't use algebra. There's a way to do it, uh, and this is what we're able to do is teach these children the concepts of algebra before teaching them actual algebra. So there are two bugs running back and forth along a straight branch at consistent speeds without stopping. They start from opposite ends of the branch and at the same time meet for the first time 40 centimeters from one end of the branch. They continue to the ends and return again 20 centimeters from the other end of the branch. How long is the branch? And so, yes, this is a fairly simple algebra question. However, how do you teach this to 9 and 10-year-olds if they do not know algebra? And so it's our teachers drawing out those proper questions and then also allowing them to work in a collaborative environment to properly communi communicate with each other. So the next question is grade 9. A jogger has attempted, let's pretend, first of all, it's, it's about a train. So they're going through a bridge, and the bridge starts here, and it ends at the end there. So a jogger has attempted to run across the bridge, a railroad bridge, and, but sees a train coming after completing three quarters of the trip. If the train is traveling at 70, or, sorry, 30 kilometers an hour, and if it is possible for the jogger to just escape being hit by the train by running at full speed to the either end of the bridge, what is the minimum speed in kilometers per hour that this jogger must be able to run? Now, 
In this case, you could use the algebra, but I wanted to really indicate to you or to talk a little bit about what's happening here. We're not just throwing any questions at these kids. And we're not just going to a contest and saying, here's some neat contest questions. If you've listened carefully, when we started with grade one, we were looking at what's the type of thinking that kids need so that we can develop good logical thinking skills and good logical thinking for our future leaders. As we develop it up, we introduce some more mathematics. And when we introduce the mathematics, we're still introducing some more logic that's a little bit more complex until you get to some of the higher levels. So problem solving is a huge component of this, but also a huge component is knowing how to do your math. So they have to incorporate this at the same time. This would be in the third month of grade five. And they no have to know a lot to be able to get to this point. So when I was in China and showed this, that this is what we were doing just recently, they actually said, well, this is our grade eight material. And no, our grade fives actually do do this. And it's, they do lots of questions like this to ensure they can work with numbers. So you can see this is not a normal curriculum like the ministry would give out. We know kids can do this. We have kids who are able to do high-level mathematics and at the same time have the logical thinking going on. So grade eight, we're able to use, again, math, but apply it, not just can you do calculations. Our kids can do calculations. They are actually given a huge amount of calculations. They have to be able to calculate very quickly so that if we say to them five times three, very quickly or five times six, they automatically know what it is even as low a grade of grade two or grade three, okay, even division. That brings in our four key elements for every single class. This is a core curriculum, our drills, our problem solving and cooperative group work. Cooperative group work is an essential part of mathematics and proper mathematical thinking. We're not here just to do procedures, okay? So all four of these come together, and this is what creates our program, which is really quite um, substantial. So what happens with kids? They come to our class once a week, and when they come to our class, they will attend like a class. It is a classroom situation for an hour and a half. And when they're in that class, they will do drills, they'll do problem solving, and they'll do mathematics. It's a 39-week program. They have tests, they have homework, they even all of them have an exam at the end of the year. And yes, they may have to repeat that year. They do, can get promoted, but they may have to repeat. So it is a program in which the kids do progress up through the years. 80% of our students, when they stay with us, stay at least for four to five years at least, and many of them start in grade one and go all the way up to grade 10, many of them, okay, so as, or 11. As Kim has mentioned, this curriculum has been developed for over 30 years. Uh, it was started with my grandfather, Charles Ledger, who he was teaching a gifted program for seven, eight, nine, and what happened was they continuously placed first on all Canadian um, math contests, and the teams continuously placed first. People were starting to forge their postal codes so they could get into his school. And once he retired, uh, this is when he teamed up with my mother, Kim, and they started teaching the basement of our house in 1993. They started with, was it 30 students or 80 students? 30. With 30 students, and they quickly grew to 100 by the end of that year. Uh, now we are Canada's largest system of after-school schools for high-performing students in mathematics. Uh, on top of that, we have now been on the Prof. 500 for the past three years as Canada's <coughs> fastest-growing company. Uh, Kim has been on the Chatelaine's uh, top 100 entrepreneur, female entrepreneur, and then also a 2015 finalist in the EY Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Um, all of this has even accumulated to this past March when we were both speaking in Beijing and Nanjing in China about Western education and comparing it to Eastern education. So this is at the 21st century education reform. Uh, it is now the number one education reform in China, and what they're trying to do is actually adopt part of Western math education. So if, if you were to think of a, a typical Eastern education versus Western, Western is all about exploring and being nice to your kids and how, do you, how did you discover what two plus two is? As East is 
2 plus 2 is 4. You, you just know it. And what they're trying to do is say that, and, and I think one of the profs even said, does the final answer matter? No. And Kim and came in and said, Hol, hold on, you don't want to adopt everything that we're doing here. It's all about a fine balance. So if you're to think of a pendulum and a clock swinging, you, you don't want to go all the way to one extreme or the other. You want to be going from one end back and forth. Did I touch up on everything there? Good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is you. Uh, all right. Um, one, our, um, because this has been so successful, as you heard, we've been invited to speak around the world to find out what's going on and why it's been so good. In the Eastern world, the focus is on computation and they want to change. In the Western world, the focus is on creativity and they would like to change. I think both is needed. We know both is needed and we have that program. The, we are doing this, we've developed this slowly but consistently to maintain our standards. We started um, in 1995 and we are now at 70, well we aim to be in 2017 at 7,500 students. Right now we're at 6,500 students. We have 40 campuses throughout Canada and one in the United States, Edison, New Jersey. We also wanted to point out that the ratio of female students to male students is almost 50-50. In a math program, that's pretty nice. And this isn't a program where kids are coming just because they need extra help. This is because they want more. So it's pretty good. Now, in parts of the world, to get females into the schools and giving them education is critical. The females are just as important because of, of their input as the males are. Uh, w one thing, uh, I'll come back. Go. Okay, and then, um, <laughs> and our global community, you can see we're from all over the world. Uh, the people who come to visit with us or to study with us. And um, we also do a little bit of online with uh, a couple of kids in China, in, sorry, not China, but in um, India. All right, so to, to touch back to the importance of the m number of females that we encourage to also collaborate in class is that uh, in, in Pakistan, I know that they're having a very hard time getting females w with their attendance to keep them into school. And so what they were doing is they, they, were, they were offering, if a perfect attendance, I can't remember if it was a week or a month, they would give them a free bottle of olive oil for the family. Now, this is very big because it increased the attendance uh, quite a bit. And when we show the stats to developing countries, they, they love it because there is always, I, I don't want to say that fear, but uh, intimidation of math when it comes to f w w with females. Um, and this right here, it, it's almost to show a little bit of a little bit of our question is we have been asked to start all over the world. Now, this is our revenue growth and year-over-year -year growth for Canada and the United States. We have 39 campuses throughout Canada and one in New Jersey, USA. Uh, as you can see here, we, we've been able to con like keep up consistent growth. However, we really do want to take this around the world. Uh, and so how do we do that? Um, because we are at an innovation conference, competition, and with a focus on technology, we thought we'd give you, first of all, where we are right now. Our back office uses SharePoint. We're in the process of creating a new student database and other Microsoft solutions. It is fairly basic, uh, especially considering there are people that are selling $200 million in strawberries. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, our, our clients have access to two different types of, uh, of products. That is our online grading system. And then we also have a hybrid online learning management system for grades five to eight uh, that follows our 39-week curriculum that gives them additional questions uh, along with a lesson that was taught that week. So as Shea Shrinks, uh, I don't think I pronounced your name right, but in the Watson presentation, they mentioned that 15% of organizations are using big data and, and advanced analytics. Um, I can tell you right now that we are not one of those. Uh, and so it comes into our question. And I just really want to make sure that I get this right. So I'm going to read off of this piece of paper. SMS has achieved considerable success without leveraging new technologies such as analytics, mobile, and artificial intelligence. With the education market morphing into much more focused, agile programs and the emphasis placed on using technologies to go digital, 
we believe that there lies a large opportunity in which to capitalize. So we want to identify opportunities to leverage digital technologies such as analytics, mobile artificial intelligence or cognitive computing to either increase our ability to grow the education business or enhance the students in class learning experience. Now the reason why we have, we have those two questions there is that in North America, uh, education right now, technology is just booming. It's all about how do you increase the child's learning, in-class learning experience. And so when we're going into sales, you know, everyone says, okay, well, what technology do you use? And we're a paper-based company, and so it's somewhat difficult for us. Well, it's not difficult, it just takes a little more time to convince them that our quality of teaching and curriculum is far superior. Uh, and then the second is that we get, like I mentioned earlier, people from all over the world, and the most lucrative and serious offers being in China, India, and Pakistan, asking us to start there. Um, now, international, com international schools in the developing world, primarily Asia, they are companies. So think of schools that have 60,000 students or 250,000 students. So how can, and they all want us to run in their, in their international schools as an after school program. So how do we, with 7,500 students, scale to 250,000 students without pulling our hair out. Uh, and so those are our two questions there. So it's leveraging our t technologies, which is critical. And uh, as we go forward, as the world goes forward, you know you all are working with big data right now. Cognitive computing is here, and it is big. We need students who are learning how to see the patterns so when they get to this level, that they're able to work with those patterns, understand the big data, understand what the computers are giving with their cognitive abilities, the AI abilities. How can we then take this to a different level using AI, using some um, technologies so that we can differentiate ourselves and not just be another math tutoring company out there that we really are producing leaders of the future. You have a chance to make a huge difference for this world in this because you will be affecting kids who will be the leaders of our future. If you take this case, it would be great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, are there any, any questions? questions? Yes. Yeah, so what, what we'll be able to provide uh, is our revenue numbers. Um, we'll, we'll see if we can, and, and the biggest thing would be our revenue numbers, our enrollment numbers, uh, and the postal codes. Uh, we're seeing if, if we can share some of the last names, so maybe you can take a look at their ethnicities. Uh, that's a study that I did five years ago. Um, this is something that we're working with uh, some of the volunteers right now, and then also our lawyers. Age, the students' age. Oh, yes, that, yeah, age yes, and grade, grade. Um, their day school as well, uh, where the campus location is so you can see how far they are, like how far they're willing to drive. Um, yeah. You got one over here. Yeah, uh, thank you. So for their second question that you're asking to enhance the learning experience, do you have any data so about how your students are motivated, how do we learn, what is the attention span, and basically all those things that can really drive the learning experience, increase motivation, and potentially bring learning to the new level. Thank uh, you. No real hard data. You know, we, like I said, we are the other 85%. Uh, what it mostly is is people from the bottom speaking up as to um, what they enjoy. So the hybrid online learning ma uh, management program that we have, uh, they said that students are saying they're signing up again the next year because they really enjoyed that. Uh, so it is more bottom up. If, if you think about it this way, it is high performing students. They're very highly motivated and the parents are just as motivated too. So they want the high quality mathematics and not just um, little activities and they also don't want just computation. So that, that's the motivation, if you, if you go with that, to find, figure out, okay, what would give them something that they are feeling more of value. Another area um, in terms of value add is that um, 
competitions are becoming much more important than mathematics uh, for entrance into universities. And so that would be a value add too, just as a little something. <laughs> Uh, I think this is an amazing business, and thanks for the presentation. I kind of had a question about customer churn. Um, I don't know if you can make this parallel, but I coach minor hockey, and uh, one of the things we experience is that parents more and more, they're trying to do hockey year-round now. And even in the summers, it's, you know, you need to be in camp all the time and be doing off-land or dry-land training. And in a lot of cases, this works, and in a lot of cases, it doesn't. So kind of, you know, I guess... Being somebody who has kind of witnessed that, do you kind of, how do you guard against customer churn of, of having those parents in the room and kind of in additional to that curriculum that they have during their day, I guess taking on, um, I guess these additional responsibilities after school? When you say customer churn, are you saying the retention rate? Are yeah, retention or kind of guarding okay. against burnout or, or I guess that kind of value for the parents as opposed to the, the kids. What? Um, our retention rate goes, our lowest retention rate for our campuses are 84% year over year, okay? So that's one thing, so they're seeing the value. Um, the other thing that we're hearing, which tends to really help, is that the parents and the students are saying that it's not necessarily that they're learning the things that they're doing in cl class, but it's helping in all areas of their lives because they're able to think through things. So it's a value add, and it's the understanding. Our hybrid online for the senior students has really helped. In addition, because they can get extra, oh, I forgot how to do that, how do I do that? In addition, our teachers are paid on salary. They're not paid by class. So they're treated as professionals, and they get benefits as well. So if they're teaching with us four evenings a week, they're paid as a full-time teacher. And so that what that means is that the students can contact the teachers on the side and get extra help if needed for Spirit of Math. And sometimes we also offer tutors to help them with Spirit of Math as well. So they will come to Spirit of Math and pay for tutors. The other thing that is very interesting is we have about 50% um, private school kids and 50% public school. Does that help answer? Okay. The back. Okay, so Dylan's wondering if you provide the parents' educational details with the data you're providing. No, we don't have that. No. Uh, okay. it's, it's very, actually, yeah, we, we, we have their occupation. However, it's stuff like sales or engineer, um, sometimes. Doctor, lawyer. Yeah, doctor, yeah. lawyer. Um, they're ve they'll very, very rarely say where they work. All right, uh, oh, we got one there. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, is basically the data uh, is like when you give the grades to the student who is enrolled with you, how long you are keeping and how, uh, like suppose uh, one student has started at grade two and he is continued till grade nine or grade eight. So are you, how you are giving uh, the results to the student? Oh, yeah. So we, we have an online grading system um, for grades one to four. Uh, they, get they, they get percentages for their assignments, but not an overall average or a rank for five and up. Uh, they get percentages for everything, over um, an average along with the rank. Uh, and every week it is updated so the parent and student can access online. Uh, and then also all the paper assignments and tests are, are handed back to them. In the data set, are, yeah. are we going to get uh, those informations as well? Uh, we're, we're working on getting it right now because we're switching uh, from one grading system and integrating into our uh, registration system. But we'll, for you, we'll, we'll do it. Okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, is that it, Dean? Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>